Thank you, Professor Schindler. Um, doesn't matter how many times we read about it or we hear about it, uh, if the capacity to shock uh, is still, uh, I think, very present uh, each time uh, we go over this horrible uh, what happened uh, or the history of the Holocaust. Um, I have, I mean, I, this is especially as you, as you summed up uh, the end, uh, this is especially, uh, you know, the lessons are particularly relevant considering the fact that we are now uh, once again um, facing <coughs> in different parts of the world um, examples of rising hatred, of communal violence, uh, even of concentration camps. Uh, once again reappearing. Um, so, I mean, it is, if it was uh, a horror, uh, it was unimaginable in the 20th century, uh, in the early 20th century, it is even more unimaginable in the early 21st century, but uh, nevertheless, here we, here we are. Um, so let me, um, let me sort of, uh, I had, uh, I had several questions, but let me sort of ask one uh, and then I'll open it up for others, uh, other comments and questions and whatnot. And those of you who would like to ask a, com a question or make a comment, you can either raise your hands or else you can put it in the chat box and then I can sort of read it out to Professor Schindler. <clears throat> uh, so my sort of question um, broadly to sort of begin with uh, is, there is a bit of a controversy about, not a bit, but fairly serious controversy about what other Western countries, Western powers, great powers could have done um, uh, about halting um, uh, what was happening inside Germany, <coughs> even after the war started, um, and about maybe bombing some of the places which supplied the chemicals for these horror uh, camps uh, or even attacking those camps and so on and so forth. I mean, the military feasibility of these things being open to question, but nevertheless, uh, what do you think um, other countries could have done, other Western powers could have done uh, in, you know, in helping uh, uh, in that situation? And what can, as we see today, this uh, not this not of the same scale or of the same uh, same um, uh, you know same events, but the leading up uh, the crystal knots being repeated or uh, you know parallels to the crystal knot uh, coming up. What should other countries do? What should the international community do? Uh, so if we could sort of Start with that, and then we will. Uh, I will open it up uh, to the uh, to the rest of the uh, for the rest of the questions. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you <clears throat> mentioned um, or implicitly mentioned the bombing of uh, of railway lines to Auschwitz because that's the most famous example. Which um, uh, Mar late Martin Gilbert wrote a book uh, um, about this. The funny thing is that. Um, I recorded late last night on uh, on uh, the television. There was a program uh, uh, devoted exactly to this. To why didn't the Allies bomb Auschwitz? It was recorded during the night, so I, I haven't actually seen this yet. But of course, the Allies were within striking distance. They could have um, bombed the railway lines. Uh, the Red Army, the Red Air Force, was also within striking distance. The plan which was submitted to uh, Churchill was shelved. They didn't, they, they, the bureaucrats in the uh, British Foreign Office effectively uh, sidelined the plan to, to build it. The, the formal, the formal um, attitude of the British at that time was, we have to win the war and everything will be okay. So there was no, there was no military attack on the railway lines that uh, attacked that um, uh, would have destroyed the the um, transportation of Jews, even at very late stage 
in the war in 1944 to, to Auschwitz. Uh, and you, you, you have this uh, situation, the idea that, Jew, that, that everything would be okay, the Jews would be saved because of the, the Allied victory. The problem was that there were very few Jews to save at the end of the day. When British soldiers entered some of the camps in 1945, they found piles and piles of corpses of people that looked like skeletons, of, of Jews, Roma, all sorts of people. And this was what was shown uh, uh, in, in the cinema that I mentioned. You see, you see British Tommies with the kerchiefs, with handkerchiefs, over their noses and, and, and mouths, like we wear masks today. But the particular Tommy in question was a, 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 a tractor driver. They would scoop up the bodies in the, the mouth of the, the, the tractor and push them into a mass grave. That is what shocked the people in the centre of London when they went to see these films. Now today, let me give you a concrete example. Charlottesville, 2017, whereby racists confronted anti-racists, where a poor woman was run down and was killed. There was also a torch-lit march by young men. They were chanting, Jews will not replace us. This is 2017. Jews will not replace us. And it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or not Jewish. That's a shocking thing to, to hear after what had happened. And to, to, to hear it from people that were born a long time after the end of the war. People who lived and loved and prospered in the 21st century. And of course there was former President Trump's uh, equivalents that both sides were equal. And more to the point, Joe Biden has said, this is what effectively brought him out of retirement to stand as the presidential candidate for the, for the Democrats. I mean, the man was 78. Did he need this? Did he need to become president? But for him, that was like the blue touch paper. That was what ignited his indignation. He felt that he had to make a stand against these pernicious forces in the United States. That's why we have a, a President Biden today. Can't hear you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Professor Shankar. Sorry, I was, I was muted. <laughs> One of these problems of uh, this thing. Uh, may I call upon uh, Dr. Kachijian to? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, if you have a question or a comment to make, uh, my apologies for. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Raja Gobalan. I appreciate it. Uh, let me say first, uh, Professor Schindler, this is a fascinating talk that you delivered. I very much appreciate it. I am a student of. Uh, of uh, Lemkin, who uh, coined the term genocide. Uh, and I sympathize, uh, of course, offer my condolences. I'm also the grandson of a genocide loss. My grandmother was murdered by the Turks. Uh, you know this better than I. Uh, the, the, the best books that have been written on the subject, probably by Robert Melson, Revolution and Genocide, who compared the Holocaust with the Armenian genocide. And of course, there are other folks who have written tremendous uh, uh, books. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, our, our own, The Modality of Indifference and a whole bunch of other books. A Couple of weeks ago, we had as part of the series, uh, Professor Navon from Israel, who gave a fascinating talk on diplomatic history of Israel. And I asked him this question as well, which I'm gonna ask you. Uh, both of us, you and me and our peoples, uh, have first-hand knowledge of what it means to be persecuted. Yet, I don't hear anything from my 
Jewish friends to say anything about what's going on in Azerbaijan when Azerbaijan murders in 2020. You mentioned Charlottesville. Uh, I am a U University of Virginia graduate. I know Charlottesville very well. I lived there for 10 years. I know what kind of racists live in that city. But your people and my people need to speak with one voice when it comes to the Azeris and what they're doing to the Armenians. My question to you is the following. What has prevented, uh, all, for all these years, men of goodwill like you and others to speak up about what the Turks and the Azerbaijanis have done to the Armenians? Yes, thank you. Um, I reviewed uh, a book by my friend Benny Morris, one of Israel's leading historians, with another Israeli. He wrote The Thirty Year War about the genocide conducted against the Armenians. I reviewed that in one of the main Jewish uh, newspapers here in, in, um, in, in Britain. And uh, what, what amazed me there, I, I thought that the, the killings had just taken place in World War I mainly, and then afterwards with the Greek-Turkish uh, War. But what I understood was that this had started much earlier in the 1890s and even before and stretched over 30 years. And uh, as I say, these were two Israelis who wrote this book. It's a huge book, five or 600 pages. I've read it. I also, I also reviewed, I think last year in the Times Literary Supplement, um, there was a book by an American, um, an American writer who castigated the the, the, the Jewish community in Turkey for eff effectively going along with the official explanation of the Armenian tragedy. Uh, and that's a very, very good book. So I, I, I wrote about that in a TLS. And um, one thing I remember from that is that I think at the end of 2019, and uh, th this, the, the, the United States Congress and indeed the Jewish community in the United States began to uh, reverse their, their, their doctrine of silence. I think basically the, the reason for this, as you probably know, is that uh, the national interests of Israel or the political interests of Israel was basically keeping uh, sweet with both Azerbaijan and indeed Turkey. And to some extent, that's why things change. But let me say this, there are many people, many Jews who identify with the state of Israel, who do not identify with the government of Israel. And there are Jews who do speak out on the Armenian question. The, the, I think you're, 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 you are right in, in, in uh, saying that because of the past history, the yeah, Ar Armenian um, tragedy should be brought further to the uh, forefront. And I hope that this will take place in, in the future. Thank you, Professor Schindler. Uh, I have a question from one of my colleagues uh, in the School of International Studies, uh, Professor Asina Negi. Uh, she says, uh, she writes, thank you uh, for the much needed revisit. Um, what explains the phenomena of negligible resistance within Germany to such a flagrant assault on humanity? And how do you assess the way in which Germany currently deals with this through memorialization, resettlement, etc.? cetera? I, I think that there, there was resistance. People have written books on this. In fact, uh, my, my own home library here uh, contains such books. Um, many communists, many social democrats were imprisoned or forced into exile. Um, and there was, of course, the White Rose Movement, uh, actually during World War II, where young people, young students, um, in fact, uh, printed leaflets against, against Hitler. This, we're talking about 1942, 1943. And the White Rose young people, the, the, the majority of them were arrested uh, and indeed guillotined by the Nazis. This was their fate. 
So there was resistance. Um, the the memorialization of uh, of Germany. It, let me give you. It's my own personal feeling. I, for many years, did not go to what was then West Germany. Um, it wasn't. It, you know, it, it wasn't a sort of a um, an overt boycott. But I thought, do I need to spend a long weekend, uh, a holiday in in Germany? And that was my my attitude. And about 10, 12 years ago, I went I went for several days with my wife to Germany, and I found the Germans were making a valiant attempt uh, in terms of memorialization to overcome their past. So, uh, so we went to the uh, Jewish Museum, for example. We went to, we went to where Hitler's bunker had been. It's uh, very, um, it's, 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 there's a deliberate diminution of its significance. And I made a point of going to uh, the Museum of Resistance of uh, von Stauffenberg, who um, was was uh, killed in the almost the last days of the war by by Hitler. So for me personally, I felt that was really something uh, special. I mean, I, I I've had many many German students um, during my career. And I, I don't, I don't think of them as Germans. I don't think of them in 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 that sense. I think of them as students, and yet there was this sort of uh, double approach uh, for myself. How do you deal? How do you deal with it? And I, I, I don't have those feelings that I used to have about Germany. I see it as a European country. I see it as a country that is a, a liberal country. And in fact, Angela Merkel has been remarkable in, in, in Europe for standing up for moral values, you know, that, uh, and, 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 and calling out uh, when terrible things have happened. I mean, the irony is that people look to Germany, not simply in economic terms, but for a moral stand. And I think that's, I think that's an amazing turnabout and it's an amazing evolution. Perhaps that's the best memorialization that can actually take place. Uh, it, if I could sort of continue on that line, because that's obviously an important question which has some relevance to uh, what happens today, uh, you know, because again, because we see these things reoccurring. <coughs> um, so I mean, there's a whole uh, Daniel Goldhagen sort of, it's been a couple of decades now, but uh, that whole argument about the complicity of ordinary Germans. I was wondering what your uh, take on that was, because of course that's been very controversial and I've had a lot of pushback on that. Uh, but I just wondered what your own sense of that was. I, I, I think maybe it's, it's almost a fatalistic approach, but it's part of the human nature to go uh, to, 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 to flow in, the, uh, to, to blow in the wind, to go with the tide. Um, 11 million people voted for Hitler. Um, and people, you know, uh, we have this in all countries of the world. People close their eyes. People prefer to be a bystander. People don't get, don't wish to become involved. Let me give you the example of the United States. It's a current example. I don't believe that Trump is Hitler. I don't believe that his followers were Nazis. There were probably good reasons for him to be elected in 2016. But people knew what he stood for, what he was like in 2020. And yet 74 million people voted for him. You know, in 1933, the, the Catholic, one of the Catholic parties 
voted in March 1933 for the Enabling Act. This effectively gave Hitler uh, dictatorial powers. They went along with it. They went along with it. They thought that they could control Hitler. So I suppose, I suppose, you know, the lesson out of all of this is that regardless of what caused you a spouse, you cannot be a bystander. You cannot, you cannot stand aside. You have to take a moral stand in all these questions, including as uh, one of the previous speakers suggested, the question of the Armenian genocide. You cannot remain silent. And I think that is one of the fundamental uh, lessons of the Holocaust. Thank you, sir. Let me read some of the other questions uh, from the uh, chat box uh, from uh, Minashi. Uh, uh, thank you for your lecture. There have been several debates on the role of the Catholic Church for fanning the spread of anti-Semitism in Europe. If you could share some comments on how far you hold the Catholic institution responsible, if it was not a pious 12, would, uh, would there have been a different scenario? Uh, but it's, it's a very good question. Undoubtedly, the Catholic Church um, propagated anti-Judaism in a theological sense for centuries. Um, if you go back to medieval times, expulsion from Spain, um, auto da fez, Jews being burnt at the stake, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But in the 20th century, they feared that, uh, that Jews and, uh, and, and Bolsheviks were one and the same. They were deadly frightened. Catholic Church was deathly frightened of the uh, advance of communism. And many Catholic bishops uh, openly espoused um, Judeo-Bolshevism. Uh, for example, during the Spanish Civil War, there was something like 50, over 50 Spanish bishops, something like 47 of them uh, supported Franco. So they supported anti-communist forces, which they identified as being primarily Jewish. Pope Pius XI uh, began to become more courageous, I would say, in his last days about what was happening in Germany intended to speak out. He died before he could. The successor, Pius XII, I think had been the Archbishop in Munich in 1919. He'd wit witnessed um, some of the uh, post-World War I uh, uprisings, often led, or on, uh, often led by Jews, but Jews were, were, were dominant in these uh, uh, movements. And he, he, he did not favor Jews. The question of whether he could have done more is an open question. And I believe that uh, a lot of the archives are now being opened uh, to do so. But let me say this in, uh, in, in, in contrast. After, after World War II, uh, I think the Catholic Church began to, to reappraise its situation. In 1960, um, Cardinal Ron Kelly uh, became Pope John the Twenty Third, and he, he had been the papal nuncio in Istanbul, in Turkey, and he issued of his own volition these protective passports. I mentioned the Swedes with Warnberg, who, who who issued these protective passports. The Vatican through Ron Kelly through Pope John XXIII when he was there, did the same. So, you know, things, things have changed, particularly since the time of, of uh, John XXIII. Uh, but if you look back in history, I don't think that the Catholic attitude towards Jews was a particularly positive one. Um, another question uh, from Shashwat. Uh, was the rest of Europe able to escape with Germany and did not really have to deal with their uh, own involvement in the Holocaust, including the persecution of Jews uh, in the Soviet Union and in Poland? 
as Tony Jutt had uh, writes about in his book Post War. That the uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand it. That the that Poland and the Soviet Union didn't the, really the, come the, to their terms own, with it. Their own history of uh, persecution of Jews. I mean, have they dealt with it adequately? Uh, you know, because all the blame sort of fell on Germany and uh, the rest of Europe. Um, sure. <laughs> the various pogroms, they never had to really deal with that or, or you know, that part of it. Uh, sure. In a sense, Mo most, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I un understand the question. Most of the uh, six million were killed in Poland or in what was then the Soviet Union, the Baltic states, in, in, in Belarus, the Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there was this twin oppression <clears throat> that. Um, Jews were being discriminated against in uh, Soviet, the Soviet Union. Um, they weren't allowed, in many instances, to commemorate their dead. You found, you found that many Soviet monuments to the dead of World War II, uh, the, name, the, the, the fact that the majority of, in certain areas, the people that had been killed were Jews, they suddenly became amorphous Soviet citizens. So <clears throat> there was no direct commemoration. Um, <clears throat> as after Stalin's death, <clears throat> uh, and particularly after the doctor's plot of January 1953, in which um, the Kremlin uh, arrested many doctors, uh, they accused them of poisoning the leaders of the Kremlin, many, uh, the vast majority of them were Jews. And it was believed that this was the precursor to uh, either exiling the vast majority of Jews to some remote place in the Soviet Union, but certainly taking some action against them. Now, fortunately, Stalin dropped dead in March 1953. And after that, there was a thaw. It was, it was actually called the thaw, the time of Khrushchev and Bulganin and, and, and these people. But Jews were still not recognized. They were still discriminated against. Uh, in, in fact, I've just uh, reviewed a book just a, a couple of days ago about um, uh, a, a journalist, a Jewish journalist who uh, wrote for a satirical magazine called Crocodile. Jews had to change their names. They had an, a Jewish sounding surname. They had to, in public, adopt a, a, a Russian surname. So, so there was this implicit... Uh, discrimination. And this is what led after 1967 to uh, a mass exodus of Jews from Russia to Israel, to America, to other places. So yes, there was this double discrimination. Now, whereas the, the Soviet Union had the gulag and many Jews, particularly during the war, were imprisoned there, many Polish Jews, the Soviet Union did not have extermination camps. It did not have uh, um, concentration camps in the sense that there were uh, gas chambers. So it was different. The Soviet Union did indeed oppress its Jewish population, uh, <clears throat> but it was not on the same genocidal level uh, as, as the Nazis. Many Jews died because of Soviet incompetence because of Soviet discrimination, but it was not the same thing as the, the Nazi experience. Thank you. Um, Professor Kumar Swami, do you have a question or is there another Kumar Swami there? No, no, no. It's, it's uh, <clears throat> And um, uh, I, I have. Uh, Professor Shindler, I have a, a, a question. If you look at the, the discussions on, on the Holocaust, Normally, countries and people and communities are classified into four broad types. Perpetrator, victim, collaborator, and bystanders. Also, rescuers and bystanders. If you look at it, India does not fit into any of these categories. We are almost, you would say, an indifferent towards them. And therefore, in a society like India, how do you at least highlight the importance of Holocaust 
in in understanding the human civilization progress as well as the flip side how do you promote the understanding of holocaust in a society like india well i i think for i think for jews all jews are survivors you know um i gain if i i seem to be talking a lot about myself here but in in this context maybe it's relevant my mother used to tell me that if it hadn't been for the 20 miles of clear blue water between england and and france that uh, my own family which has been in england for hundreds of years would have met the same fate as jews in mainland europe so i think for jews it's very it's very personal it's 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 something important um i think for 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 the british for for, for non jews in britain it's also very symbolic it's interesting about 15 years ago i think the bbc uh had a competition who was the greatest britain of all time you know some some television uh <laughs> competition and who won overwhelmingly was winston churchill now this is this is 40 50 years after churchill had died and yet the the memory of world war 2 is carried down through to their grandchildren their great grandchildren down the generations for india it's more complex because i know that gandhi was reticent about supporting the war even though he hated hitler and he hated antisemitism he hated racism i think for for anti um anti imperialist and anti colonial movements it's a slightly different situation that they uh, that india or ireland or um or even egypt there were nationalists who were fighting for independence against against uh britain so it's a slightly different thing i think the main i think the main task in today's world and this may indeed apply to india is that the holocaust was the event which shows what can happen if you don't take a stand against certain evil practices if you don't if you act the bystander if you're only interested in your own individual concerns if you don't care about other people in one sense the jews are the canary in the mine when the canary begins to sing when the canary smells the gas in the in the coal mine then you know that something is wrong so that i think is the you know i, I don't pretend to pronounce on on uh, on the lessons of the holocaust for individual indians but i think in a universal sense it's important that people should see what could happen if you if you if you bury your uh, head in the sand like an ostrich if you don't take a stand if you merely allow things to pass by and like the like the the german catholics in 1933 you get caught up with it you become you become a collaborator in in a, in a silent way in an indirect way and i think that that's that's my personal opinion uh professor ramakrishnan uh, would you like to ask a question or to make a comment yes um thank you uh, rajesh rajgopal um uh, thank you professor shindla for um such a significant lecture and uh, reminding us uh, of the uh, dangers of uh, um the kind of uh, ideologies that uh, 
basically uh, you know murdered so many people and as a as a non jew uh, you know i could not stop crying when i went to auschwitz and birkenau um uh, you know one has to have that uh, that feeling of humanity and remember auschwitz uh, um for for making humanity feel um in the present day context and in future um what kind of uh, politics and societies we should have and in that sense um, you know from your explanations of what was happening in europe um the, the way germany acted the the main question is what are the combination of factors that created this situation for the jews um you have mentioned various actors involved in it but this antisemitism itself the ideological content of it the um you know the economic situation the the <clears throat> notion of uh, kind of new Uh, extreme nationalist sentiment that is politically being created the you know the the phenomenon which is very common now that uh, uh, you know we elect our dictators through proper elections you see <laughs> and dictators so uh, these kinds of phenomena together contributing to a situation where the humanity is at risk and, and and the jewish people experience that in a big manner so in order that we can think about our contemporary situations and move towards the future what are these combinations of factors in europe at that time that we should uh, you know understand today um that's one aspect of it the, the, there's another question or together that's about you know we cannot overlook the fact that non jewish people the roma you have uh, just mentioned in passing muslims many others uh, um you know black people many others were roma in particular um uh, were uh, affected by nazi policies um, in a big manner many of them were killed as well so uh, a, you know some take on that uh, would illuminate us more thank you very much thank you um i think just on the last point i think that um sure the jewish question the extermination of the jews has indeed overshadowed the killing of the roma uh, the killing of uh, homosexuals um the killing of jehovah's witnesses um you know perhaps it's because because behind that there were hundreds of years of persecution of the jews you know the the, the cliche is that it's uh, after 1945 uh Jews said never again so i i i do believe that there's there's this how do i put it very emotional vociferous uh and powerful reaction from individual Jews so uh, when they see antisemitism they they effectively blow up you know and <laughs> never never again ha- is more than a slogan it has meaning so that that may be the reason why peop less people know about the persecution of the roma for example <laughs> now I, on the major part of your question um i think in the the 18th century going back to the french revolution jews began to see themselves as a people that the jews were more than if you like the people of the bible 
that the Jews had a had a, a, a culture, a literature, a history, languages. They were more than than a religion per se. Although the religion was part of their national characteristics. And therefore you have in the 19th century, with the rise of uh, particularly European nationalism, you have the rise of Jewish nationalism. And given the development of, uh, of nation states in the 19th century, the Jews who didn't fit in, they didn't fit into theory, they didn't have their own state, they didn't have their own economy, etc. They were part of host societies who tried to contribute. But quite often, European nationalism said, we don't want these people. They are, they are outsiders, even though they may have been part of the uh, society for hundreds of years. And of course, when Jews were allowed to um, go to university, for example, when Jews were allowed to enter the professions, there was a sense of jealousy, a sense of rivalry. <laughs> let me give you, let me give you an example. Um, Karl Marx. Um, there's a very good book by Shlomo Avineri, by the way, it uh, came yeah. out uh, <laughs> uh, a year ago. I, again, I reviewed that, it's, it's very interesting. Um, the Marx during during the Napoleonic Wars, the French occupied part of Germany, part of Prussia, and Jews had equal opportunity. When Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, and the Prussians took over once again, they reintroduced discriminatory laws against the Jews. So, for example. Uh, Marx and his his uh, his father. They were that the Marx wasn't allowed to to become a lawyer. I believe the only way he could uh, enter the profession was to become a Lutheran. Uh, you have all of these anomalies, and that is in is it, it essentially is symbolic about the the European nations. In addition, you have the Catholic Church. Um, one of the popes, well, one, one of the, the, there's a story about, uh, about a Jewish child being baptized um, by one of the maids that, that worked work for them. And when the Catholic Church heard about this, they took the child away from the parents. This, we're talking about the, the middle of the 19th century. and was brought up as a ward of the of the Pope, because the person had become a Catholic. Or you have the Dreyfus affair. You know, so even if Jews wanted to assimilate, wanted to convert, up until then he was quite assimilated and with the election of Karl Luger who was known to be vehemently uh, against the Jews Herzl began to look into himself and he came up with the Zionist solution that's why you you have the the Jewish state was written by Herzl in it was 1895 1896 so you 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 have this background of the Jews uh, in the 19th century seen as some powerful force in which European nationalists begin to discriminate against them, begin to them. And in the 20th century, with the defeat of World War I, even though you had something like, I think, 12,000, um, a huge number, I can't remember the exact number, huge numbers of Jews fought for the Kaiser Huge numbers of Jews were decorated, and yet 
the Jews were held responsible for Germany's defeat. None of it made any sense. But, you know, if, if you can convince people, uh, for example, you convince people in the United States the vote was stolen, right? So what I'm trying to say is, as much as I don't want to say it, is that people are easily swayed, they're easily sucked in uh, by, by demagoguery. They're easily sucked in by people that pronounce great ideas without any factual basis. And, you know, in the United States, uh, in the election, over 75% of Jews voted against Trump, even though he was very positive to Israel, even though he fell, you know, Israelis fell over themselves for, for, for Trump. The, it was only the, the, the Jews voted against Trump because they understood the lessons of Jewish history. They were liberals in a universalist sense. The, the, I mean, and the interesting thing is, the, the Jews, you know, to be perfect, a very affluent community in the United States. And yet they still voted for the Democrats. Their socioeconomic uh, affiliation should have been with the Republicans. They refused to do it. And their vote, uh, their overwhelming vote, <coughs> was only exceeded by American blacks who don't have the same uh, e economic status as Jews. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me read a couple of, uh, or just go over a couple of questions from the chat box. Uh, Marudan uh, refers to the question of uh, how persecuted Jews, after they found out their state, uh, in turn became uh, persecutors of uh, persecutors of Palestinians. I mean, so that question about uh, the Palestinian rights and so on and so forth. Uh, another question, uh, if I could add on, um, uh, is about, uh, you know, from Rohit Sharma, asks about, um, you know, in England, uh, anti-Semitism within the Labour Party, uh, Mr. Corbyn, uh, and accusations of anti-Semitism uh, towards him, and how you sort of uh, look at that. If you could just address those two questions, and then we can sort of... Yeah. One more question. Um... The, the Israeli uh, conquest of the uh, West Bank and Gaza in 1967 um, has proved to be a poison chalice for Israel. Um, the problem of the Israel-Palestine conflict is, is that there were two rival claims uh, over the same piece of land, both Jewish nationalism and Arab nationalism arose at the same point in history with claims over the same piece of land. So it's a national conflict and the logic is partition, Palestinian state and Israeli state. To me, you, know, you, could, you can go into all the, the details, the minutiae, but that's the, that's the problem. Um, there are many organizations in Israel that oppose the, um, the Israeli presence in the territories. There are many uh, Israeli organizations that oppose the settlement drive. For example, I can tell you in, uh, in Britain, there have been several scientific surveys, one by the Institute of Jewish Affairs, another one by City University, and it, uh, it looked at, at uh, the attitudes of British Jews towards the settlement drive. And in each case, 75% of British Jews opposed the settlement drive. So the point is that Israel and the Jewish world is not a homogeneous entity. There are people who very much oppose the, the policies of the Netanyahu government. Identification with the state is not the same as identification, the, the, the government. And um, one of the problems with the far left is that they talk about genocide of the Palestinians, etc. They try and turn the Israelis into Nazis. That's not the case. 
if uh, if the if the Israelis uh, were Nazis, where are the crematoria? You know, so opposition to some things that are going on in Israel is widespread in the diaspora and also within Israel. Um, in, for example, in the, uh, the there's a there's an election coming up uh, very shortly, and in this election. The, the, I think the latest poll suggests that uh, Netanyahu's Likud will get 30 seats. Now that's 30 seats out of 120. So the Likud will get 25% of the votes and 75% of the Israelis will, vote, will not vote for the Likud, will not vote for Netanyahu. So you, you have this, you have this um, strange situation. So let, that's one question. Let me come to the question of the, of the Corbynist as the far left. You could argue that Jeremy Corbyn is not an anti-Semite, certainly. On the other hand, he sat on panels whereby different speakers have indeed uttered anti-Semitic comments. And he sat there quietly, hasn't said a word. He has allowed uh, instances of anti-Zionism, which is a valid uh, stand, to tip over into anti-Semitism. That's the problem. And with the advent of the electronic media, he hasn't taken a stand. Corbyn believes passionately in the Palestinian cause. I have no personal objection to that, but he's never acted as a mediator between Israelis and Palestinians. He's never said, I'll act between the peace camps of both sides. He has this attitude uh, of turning a blind eye to certain terrible things that may take place in the developing world because he, he's an anti-imperialist, he's an anti-colonialist. So for example, in the 1980s, when uh, Iran was executing many Iranian socialists, he didn't say a word. Instead, he went on Iranian television, press, press uh, TV, and spoke many, many times. Like, you can't have these double standards if you're a socialist. And th this, is, this, I think, is the, the main uh, criticism of Corbyn. But uh, he is actually not living up to the high moral standards that socialism uh, dictates. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mudasir? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Schindler, for that very thought-provoking and you know, enlightening lecture and reminding us of the, you know, uh, uh, the, the horrible you know, Holocaust, which took place. Uh, I have a question regarding the idea of uh, Holocaust education, uh, since I've been associated with some of these events uh, <coughs> in Holocaust education in the past. Uh, two points. One is, uh, how do you think that, you know, the Holocaust education can be made more universal? Uh, do you think the, the point about uh, incorporating Holocaust education in the larger, you know, idea of genocide education would be more useful in terms of, you know, spreading uh, the the idea of Holocaust education, and not just, you know, with, within the specific. I mean, obviously, the, the significance can never be, and you have highlighted that point uh, in your reaction uh, earlier. But to make it more, uh, you know, universal in terms of, you know, idea of genocide education. Your thoughts on that? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that's an important question. Um, I, I, I believe that um, Holocaust education should not remain within um, a particular sphere. There are universal questions that pertain to this. But I think the, the core of, if you like, even genocidal education must be the Holocaust. It's highly symbolic. 
it's highly symbolic. So I would, I, I would argue that that has to be at the core. It has to be the almost the central understanding. It, not, not because it's the Jews, but because it's high, highly symbolic in the, in a universalist sense. And that local examples where genocide has taken place should be, you know, if you like, attached to that. That, it, that out of understanding the symbolic, um, the, the symbolism of the, of the Holocaust, you can relate to other terrible things like the Armenian uh, killings during World War I. So I, I'm not one of those who, who, who says only the Jews, but I do think that the, Jew, the Jewish uh, example is the central example, the most symbolic example, and then you, you relate it to other questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Schindler. Uh, I think it has been a fascinating uh, talk. Um, uh, we are, uh, of course, very grateful to you for uh, joining us this morning so early and taking the time off at, uh, at this ungodly hour uh, for, from your, uh, for, you know, uh, in your part of the world. Um, this is, I think, you know, we, we, the the one is the, one of the. Uh, difficult things to come to grips with is that 20 years back uh, during the Yugoslavian civil war, Europeans across the continent were saying, you know, how can this happen again in, uh, in Europe um, when you had a similar <coughs> kind of discrimination and, uh, and uh, massacres and uh, violence, um, you know, in, in, the, in the Balkans. Um, Today, uh, 20, 30 years later, it seems as if that particular trend has spread and you see even, even more worrying developments, as I said in the beginning, uh, across the world. I mean, it's some, you know, it's, it's uh, I, and I, I, and, and I know a lot of people try to sort of see, see this as part of a common process, but even though the common elements in that are difficult to difficult to find, except that there is rising nationalism, there is rising, um, maybe it's the consequence of identity politics or, or whatever else, but there is a rising hate, uh, you know, it, it, it is, uh, I think, um, these are things that we, that uh, horrible as they were, uh, one thought was left in the history books, but obviously um, it is, uh, but the history books, I suppose, can still and the history of it can still teach us um, <clears throat> the dangers um, of where we are going um, in many parts of the world. And so I think uh, we need to continue doing this, continue to sort of learn the lessons of what happened, continue to revisit that, um, however terrible those were, those days were. Um, and so, again, we are extremely grateful to you for uh, your talk um, and um, thank uh, all the participants for their questions and comments. And let me pass this back on to my colleague, Professor Kumar Swami, for his final comments and thoughts. Professor Kumar Swami. Thank you.